Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 224 for Tuesday, September 3rd, 2019. Folks, and welcome back to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians. Sponsors, we have a new sponsor, Chauvet DJ at ChauvetDJ.com. We'll tell you why you want to go there and how to spell it uh, in a little bit. But for now, here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Las Gatas, California, it's Paul Kent. Hey, man. How was... Uh, how was your, did we, I don't think we talked last week. We, we didn't, right? We talked before we've had two weekends since we talked. So, right. Yeah. 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 How you had, I had my uh, big, yeah, you had my big show. Day. Yeah. How was yeah. that? Yeah. That was great, man. It was so, it was so fun. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's the town that I live in. So that's one thing that's kind of cool. It's the seventh year. So it has, has its own kind of momentum and its own kind of life. Yeah. The band has been playing great. And so we were, and every, and the band gets very excited for this show because it's a great showcase for us. And, you know, it's about somewhere between three and 4,000. We don't sit there and, you know, count heads or anything like that, but just sure. from a rough estimate of how deep and how far it goes back. And just the vibe is so nice. I mean, we have a 3,000 square foot dance floor that we build and it's packed almost from downbeat on. You know, we've changed the format of it over the years. We used to have an opening band, but the opening band would start, you know, around a little earlier in the day and it was still kind of high sun. And it, he wasn't drawing, you know, anybody out, mostly because, you know, it was still pretty hot out. But oh, when we yeah. start 7 to 930, which is a great time slot. And uh, yeah, the whole band was up for it. We played great. So many people taking pictures and videos. So, and then also saying how much they like the band. So it's like one weekend that is like a year's worth of promo. Right. Oh and yeah, for sure. So I'm curious. And, uh, I, I, and I think I know the answer to this, but just to sort of put it into context for everybody, you say that we set up a stage, y you are separately, but, but jointly involved in not only playing this gig, but organizing it, but it's not a house rockers gig you're not charging admission like this is your town's budget putting this together and you just happen to be part of the organizational committee for that is that right no so oh, actually the sorry. history of this is, no no not a problem <laughs> the history of this is i had the idea for the event so we have a big beautiful Got park it. in our town big beautiful open field of a park um with like fire barbecue pits around and you know stuff for kids to do and and it's just a, i've always thought it is a perfect venue to have an event like this and um, so I partnered with, I brought the idea to a local community nonprofit several years ago and, uh, they liked the idea. They had their own reasons for liking the idea, but they, they liked the idea and we partnered and we did it together for a couple of years. And then for several reasons, I took it out of that realm and started just producing it, um, on its own. Okay. It's own thing. Okay. So I, I go out and raise sponsorship money for it. Got it. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Yep. So, you know, the, so the costs for it are like, you know, we bring in a, a big array outdoor sound system, not like a club sound system. So we bring in a significant sound system to, to service 3,000 people. Sure. 4, people. Yeah. Uh, insurance, uh, the dance floor that we build, we bring beautiful lights. And you've met my buddy, Scott. Um, he oh, has, yeah. he, he came on several years ago. I asked him to join to just do the marketing of it. I was going to say that dude is just a born marketer. <laughs> he is he a just, machine. He yeah. oozes marketing. That's right. Yeah. 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 And, uh, and then, you know, as a few things have changed, he and I have become the partners that uh, there's a little bit more detail that I'm leaving out, but sure. this is the essence of the story. Yep. And he and I have put it on the last several years together. Um, we have a nice flow to who does what and, you know, who's responsible for what things. And, you know, the work is divided nice and evenly. That's great. Um, yeah, so it's become a thing. I mean, okay, but, we both but this live in was town. not this. I it, it, this is. I mean, it's different than I what I thought it is. But but this actually tells. This is a very informative story, right? Because you saw an opportunity. Obviously, you play in your band. You but you also live in your town, right? And and you know both of those things. 
So you saw an opportunity a number of years, maybe even a decade ago about, hey, like there's a thing that could happen, but like it needs to happen. So I'm going to lead the charge and see if I can drum up support from other people so that I'm not just carrying the load alone. But like this is the kind of thing that if you are sick and tired of slogging it out in clubs and want to differentiate, we've talked about differentiators. What a great way to differentiate your band. I mean, your band now is synonymous with this Los Gatos Park dance. And it, like you said, you get, you know, a, a year's worth of marketing in one day. I mean, not it's one day of performance. Of course, there's yeah. a lot more that goes into it. But right. Like you get a lot of benefit for your band out of this. And and the town enjoys it, too. It's not it's not it is not a zero sum game. Right. Like, no, this is it's a, a, it's this a good is idea a, that works for many people in many ways. It's I mean, a win, win, win. That's right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. The first couple of years, I actually went, you know, I offered the band services to, because it was a nonprofit and, you know, that we wanted it to stay low cost. Sure. The band actually donated its services. You know, in my band, we kind of have a loose agreement that there is tolerance for one to two charity events a year, unless something really good comes along. Yep. Could be more, could be could be less. But this was back then. This was one of the you know, the complimentary things. And it worked on so many levels. It was it was a nice way to say thank you to the people who support us. We're well enough known in our town that that we were a part of the equation. You know, we were yes. part of the draw. Yes. Right. So. Right. So. Right. Yeah. That's great, and, uh, man. Yeah. No, so and, and, and that like even that part of it, I like th there's nothing wrong with creating your own event and i realized that this didn't quite start that way but but i mean at some level it was right you were certainly involved there's nothing wrong with creating your own event and and you know effectively donating your time or not getting any profit out of it uh to to establish it and turn it into a thing i mean our our Cirque de Mac parties were exactly that right like it yeah. It, it yeah it, so I, I i guess really the, if i'm gonna sort of distill this down look at the big picture and don't be afraid to play the long game for stuff like this. It's not always going to work out, but when it does, it's actually kind of really nice. Well, I'll, I'll be very candid. I am to this day still cautious about any criticism that I only did this to promote the band. Right. So originally it was a very altruistic thing. Sure. And it was a fun thing. I knew that the band would get some credit for it, but I didn't do it, you know, and it was, trust me, it was especially in the early days, hundreds, if not thousands of hours to get this thing built, oh, yeah. you know, spending all the time to raise the money, figuring out how to, you know, form a nonprofit and all, you know, all the different things that had to go on. It was a lot of time. And I'm still, this is actually one of the great things about having Scott as a partner is I can kind of keep my head down on some of these things. And I, I would say now, even though I'm the one who started it, I'm a little bit more behind the scenes with because Scott does the marketing. Right. That's great. I'm a little bit more yeah. behind the scenes. So it kind of works, but I'm still, you know, sensitive that, you know, someone would say, oh, you only did it to promote the band. You know, you know, what I'll, say about, you know out, what I'll say about that? It doesn't matter. Like it, it, I, it probably doesn't. It doesn't. And, and I know, obviously, I know you, you and I have known each other for a very long time. I, I totally grok that it is in your personality to be sensitive about those things. And and that's one of the most endearing things about you. But well, I would, uh, yeah, but I would say to anyone listening, don't sweat that particular detail necessarily. Like put together a good thing, put together something that, you know, think about, like I said, think about the big picture is, are people going to enjoy this? Is it going to, you know, is it going to be something that, Everyone gets benefit from. And if the answer is yes, it doesn't matter what your catalyst is. It matters to Paul what his is, and it should matter to you what yours is. But it doesn't matter to the rest of us what yours is. As long as you're putting together a good thing in the end, I, who cares what, where the idea came from? Like, just don't, don't. I wouldn't say I wouldn't get I wouldn't let yourself. It's so easy when you have these grand ideas, you know, you're sitting around, you know, either, you know, having coffee or beers or whatever. And you're like, oh, wouldn't it be cool if right. How many of those ideas die when the check mm. is paid? Right. Like, that's yeah. it. So don't let the don't let the well, are we just doing this to promote the band? Yeah. So we shouldn't do it there. there you are going to come up with a million reasons why you <laughs> shouldn't do this. Don't let that be one. Y you know, just plow forward. It's OK. Just make a good thing and you're good. So that's well, great, I, I, I really appreciate it. And I will say most musician friends that I know think it was 
genius, you know, and yeah. they're like, yeah, you got to promote your band. Again, I have a little sensitivity to this stuff. And it's my own problem. But um, <laughs> I didn't and then, say it was know, a problem. I just, you well, know, for me, didn't want to you know, inherit. I didn't want anybody else to necessarily inherit uh, that uh, like, because that didn't <laughs> stop you. Right. I mean, that that fueled you to perhaps make it even bigger than it was. Right. You know, because you didn't want it to just be about your band. So fine. That's great. But it's OK. You know, just it's make okay. a good thing. Just make a good thing. It's fine. Yeah. I am. Um, oh, this is a good thing. Yeah. I had I I don't have quite as as deep a, uh, a, a story to tell, but I did play uh, another gig with Amanda and CJ Lewis this week or last week, whatever it was since we chatted last another acoustic gig. And the, I mentioned the first one that we played was fantastic. You know, we, it was the first time CJ and I had ever played together. I mentioned how Amanda, you know, just told us, look, trust yourself. Everything will be fine. It'll work out. And it did. Right. And then we did one, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago, it was like a, an early evening, last minute thing for a party that was happening at a local restaurant. And we just threw it together and it was, it definitely felt like sophomore slump, but I think it was, it was not, we didn't go in with the right attitude. At least that's what I told myself when we left. It was like, yeah, it was okay. It was fine. We entertained, but it could have been better. Right. So we show up for this gig on, on Thursday and it was at the same place as the first one. The guy that runs the place really smart. He does this wing night on Thursdays, packs this joint. And this is the place where they have speakers throughout the ceiling and just give us a quarter inch cable to plug into our mixer and they control the level. Right. So like the guy is really smart. He knows how to run a, a, a successful bar slash whatever you want to call it. And I and we got about halfway through the first set. And I'm like, all right, I figured out what the problem was with the last gig because we're having it here now too. the first one. There were four of us. Amanda was on one end. We all stood essentially in a line. Amanda was on uh, stage left. I was on stage right. CJ and then the bass player, John, were in between us. So it was Amanda, CJ, John, Dave. Um, John's a pretty short dude. CJ and I could see each other's faces all night long. So whenever either of us or both of us went up to sing, we could like quickly glance and see what the other one was doing. And it locked in. Amanda's a pretty tall person. And so at the at the, the gig in the middle, the second one, and then at this gig the other night, she's like, oh, since it's just three of us, I'll sit up in the middle, put, you know, CJ on my left and Dave on my right. I'm like, yeah, it's fine. But with us all equal at the front of the stage, if Amanda's singing, I can't see CJ at his microphone. And it was like, aha, this is why we're having trouble locking in. So. I, I started nudging things around on stage. So we sort of built a very shallow you and all three of us were able to see each other and almost instantly, like everything smoothed out in the gig. And we talk about, um, you know, music is a live music is a visual art form. Well, it, evidently it it's visual on stage too. Right. And I'm, <laughs> I've always been really sensitive about this, especially like in theater pits where I know we're setting up and we're going to, you know, it's going to be that way for X number of gigs or whatever. I am. I it, it, probably some people hate me for it. Maybe, maybe I've even not gotten called back for gigs for it, but I am usually very adamant about, I need to see at the very least, I need to be able to see the piano player. I would like to be able to see everyone, but yeah. like, table stakes is I need to be able to see the person that I'm most often locking in with, which in a theater pit is the, the piano player. That that's generally for me, how that goes. Would and you if, reconfigure your, your drum kit to enable that? Like, yes. Like interesting. I'd move a symbol to be able to see someone's face. Absolutely. Yeah. I've done it many times. Yeah. 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 Because it's really important or it's not just someone's face. Like um, when we were doing these Hedwig gigs, I really wanted Susie, our piano player, to my left. It turned out I had Ken, our guitar player, to my left just because of some logistics. And that was great, too. I mean, Ken and I get along and we had a blast. But my left is sort of the way that I will naturally look at, at a drum set. And with Susie, she was placed to my right. She's our keyboard player uh, and uh, and and officially the music director of Hedwig. Most Hedwig is basically a rock band, so there's not a whole lot of opportunities where it really even matters who the music direct director is, but she did a great job like arranging all the harmonies and all of that stuff. But on stage, it's just, we're a rock band. We all got to see each other. And I would uh, very intentionally position my drums, even like twist my kit a little bit so that I was more looking at her so I could see her hands 
because if I, you know, if something happens, there's, there was one tune in particular, but a lot of times where I just watch the keyboard players hands to get that, that, you know, where, where are they grooving? How are they grooving? I can lock in visually sometimes better than I can lock in audibly. If, if sounds a little muddy at, a, at one spot or whatever, um, the beginning of the show in particular, we play the Hedwig starts with America, the beautiful, like just, just like the, the head of it in a very slow kind of stately thing as Hedwig marches herself on stage. And then the keyboard player starts this like driving rock tune. And I got to come in two beats, two bars later and if I can't hear because of the mayhem of like guitar chords being held and, you know, cymbals washing, if I can't hear where she is, I can't come in, you know, and I mm. got to just I got to bring the band in wherever I think we are. It's better if I can see your hands. So, yeah. So, yes, I, I will position myself. But I never thought about it with harmonies before. Uh, it never dawned on me how important it is to, you know, be able to glance at someone. I mean, I do it in fling all the time. Aaron and I know each other now. I don't know how much we look at each other, to be perfectly honest. But, you know, we've been doing it for more than a decade. We kind of Not so much for the tone because you need your ears for that, but more for like the meter. Yeah, the, 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 the blending. blending, but also like with CJ, it was more, OK, who's going up? Who's staying here? And, and just I, like being able to have that. That conversation via, you know, osmosis or something, but just looking at each other and knowing like, OK, I know that, you know, where I am, like which one of us is if we're both on the same note, which one of us is going to stay here. And mm. and with a little glance, you can communicate a lot of that um, as it turns out. So, yeah, it was really interesting to to, you know, like make sure you can see each other in a in a way that matters to you. And, and of course, you know, you're not going to be able to see each other hundred percent of the time all night long. In fact, you shouldn't be looking at each other hundred percent of the time all night long. You should be engaging with the crowd and, you know, doing other things, but to be able to steal that quick glance in the right moments and say, okay, yeah, we're locked in. Great. Now I can still focus on these other things or I can resume mm -hmm. focusing on these other things. It's important. So think about that, you know, and, and that, that shallow you man, like that made a huge difference. <laughs> so anyway, that's uh do you find that at, at your at your shows do you think about it I, much well now now that you're talking about it i definitely i definitely realize i am in visual contact with every member of the band for different things through, yep. through time yeah sometimes it's to indicate we're not going to go to the next song on the list sometimes it's a vocal thing sometimes it's a reality check that i are we singing the right thing here right? yeah yeah right so, exactly you know, yes exactly it's, it's yeah solo sometimes it's uh sometimes it's watch me i'm gonna do something you'll figure it out when we get there so yep. definitely yep. yeah i mean this is that's but that's that's live performance right? that's live that's, performance exactly yes yes exactly that, that was an interesting thing for us to teach to because in theater you know you're you're the band is not supposed to be um traditional live theater the band is not you're not the, the, the actors are not supposed to be seen interacting with the band. Right. The band is just there to play the music that the actors are then singing and, and dancing and, you know, doing whatever their choreography tells them to do. Uh, when we started doing like these madhouses and bitter pill, which is sort of the first one of those and, and some theater shows like Hedwig, where it's supposed to be a band on stage, you know, and, mm -hmm. and the band is it's like a rock band and it's OK to look at each other. It took quite a bit of work to untrain some of these folks into like, no, no, no. Like, look at me. Let's count the song mm. off together. If it's too slow, look at me. Just like in a rock band, we can go faster if you want. You know, like these things are or if we're lost, look at me. We can solve these problems, but don't pretend like in theater. If things get lost, like you just like, OK, let's hope everybody's thinking along the right stand, the right way. But. Gosh, if I have to look at the music director and the people in the audience can see me communicating with that person that we've like, that's a train wreck, right? That Like that's the first step of a train wreck in, in live theater. But, um, but it's not when, when it's not supposed to be that way. For sure. Yeah. Yep. So, Hey, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to take a minute and talk about our new sponsor, Chauvet DJ. That's C-H-A-U-V-E-T DJ, you know, the letters D and J dot com. So Chauvet DJ is not just for DJs. They make lighting 
that is for anyone performing on stage because your audiences want to see who's rocking. <laughs> Chauvet, the, the parent company, has a lot of different brands. Chauvet DJ is the right one for folks like you and me and everybody listening here. They are the ones that make the stuff that you want to get and use on stage. In fact, years ago, long before we started Gig Gab, let alone long before Chauvet became uh, a sponsor of this show, we added Chauvet lights to Fling and Russ, uh, you know, sort of took the lead on that. And he got a couple of their four bars, the old ones. We've got some new ones, which have a feature that's going to be way better. Uh, but, um, it, you know, he got a bunch of those and he actually rigged up like a wired controller into his pedal. But the cool thing is Chauvet DJ has been iterating since then and they make lighting control super, super easy. All their LED products have multiple control options, including auto programs and sound activation modes, wireless foot switches. I know Russ is going to be freaking out when he hears about this. Uh, <laughs> perfect for guitarists, right? And other remote control options, including some speakers or some speakers, some lights. Even have, you'll see why I said speakers, they have Bluetooth wireless in them, right? But it's, it's lights, Crazy. not speakers. So yeah. you can, you don't even need extra hardware as long as you have some kind of tablet, you know, Apple Android device with a Bluetooth app. They've got a app that they call BT Air and it's available for both platforms and you can control your lights with that stuff. And it, I'll tell you. Lights make a huge difference. You know, huge we, difference. I mean, what did we what did we say? You know, ten minutes ago here in the show, music performing live music is a visual art. Well, guess what, folks? <laughs> like, part of that is making yourself look good under the lights, and you got to have lights in order to do that. <laughs> I I just want to pause you for a second. Yeah. We should we should really dive more into lights because it is such a game changer on so many levels. It it will make your band look that much more professional than 90% of the other bands that are going to be out there right away right? too. Yeah. Right away. A very simple thing. And then as, as you get more adept at learning how to program them and do things that help enhance your show, it is a game changer. I mean, like in the same way, having a great amp is a game changer for a guitar player for a full band, you know, to be in the light, to have lights accentuating emphatic parts of your show, you know, to be able to draw the audience's attention in certain ways or set moods is just such a powerful tool for this visual performing art. It, it is really remarkable. We bought some Chauvet lights years ago um, and we've added to it. You know, now we have all sorts of things. We have, you know, spots and, you know, blinking lights and all different types of, of uh, effects that we have. And we actually have a guy on the shows where we can afford it who, uh, who runs learned how to for you. program it. Yeah. And he runs it for it. It makes a such a difference. I mean, it just makes your show pop. Yep, it does. So make your show pop. Rock in the spotlight with Chauvet DJ. And you can learn more at ChauvetDJ.com. That's C-H-A-U-V-E-T-D-J.com. And remember, it's, you know, Chauvet DJ is really where you want to be looking for this stuff. You start looking at the other Chauvet brands. You might not find what you're looking for, but Chauvet DJ that's what's made for you. It's not just DJs. It's for anyone performing on stage. And that's who audiences want to see. So rock in the spotlight with Chauvet DJ. Our thanks to ChauvetDJ.com for sponsoring this episode. Very Paul, cool of them to come on board. Yeah. Yeah. Paul, you had an idea to talk about when putting together a, an agreement, I'll say for a gig. I don't necessarily want to say contract, but contract might is one type of agreement, you know, um, you asked what should be in the rider. And yeah. Yeah. I think that's a, I like, I like this topic. Yeah. And then this came about because invariably, you know, you start out with your band, especially if you're not an experienced musician and you're happy to get a gig and you will put up with an awful lot. And <laughs> then true. as time, yeah. right. You'll, you'll put up with, you know, bad parking, you know, sun directly on your face for three hours. I mean, there's, there's a lot of things that you put up with and over time we've added to our rider and I thought it would be a pretty useful conversation uh, and hopefully it'll spur some conversation. We'll get some comments on, but I just thought I'd share a couple of things that are in our, in, in our rider. And I'd love to hear what you uh, have either have put in riders or recommend for your bands to put in riders, but yeah, just feed, be a useful feedback conversation. at giggabpodcast.com. Yeah. yeah. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. 
So obviously, you know, you start with your price and your price terms. That's a more contract thing, but you know, it's it's kind of a functional. Yeah. What is being asked of the client? So you know, you know, do you require a signed contract for a date to be locked down? Fifty percent deposit, ten percent deposit, one hundred percent, you know, prepayment, whatever it might be. You know, what is what is due? Is it before you start playing? Uh, you know, immediately after you're done playing, you know, when do you take care of the rest of the money? So, so in the money part, that's really contractual, but somewhat relevant to this kind of conversation. What are you asking for? Next thing for us, we ask routinely for 24 bottles of water at the stage. Right. I like this. Yeah. yeah. We ask for, a, if it's an outdoor gig, we asked if we asked for a stage, actually a stage is part of our rider and we have the size and the electrical requirements as well, you know, how much electricity, you know, we, we ask for five 20 amp circuits. We can deal with three, but we start at five and we let people, you know, talk to us if they, if they have to. Um, and that takes care of Chauve lights and our sound system yeah. and all our backline stuff. So, so, uh, you know, our electrical requirements are part of our rider. I said tw- 24 bottles of water um, on certain types of gigs uh, where we know food is involved. I'll ask for 12 meals. Um, you know, if I know food is involved for everybody. So if it's a corporate gig, uh, if it's around the dinner hour and we know that there's going to be food served, obviously if there's a wedding, we'll ask for 12 meals, 10 band members and two crew. I was going to say, don't forget and don't be shy about that. Include your crew like that. Yeah. There's nothing. Obviously there's I, you, tr- you see them as equals. So does everybody else. In fact, like that's a normal thing to like, of course you got the people that need to, it's not just the people on stage we're feeding. It's what it takes to put those people on stage. And as we all well know, some, some bands and some gigs require more than just the people on stage to make it happen very much. So in fact, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And actually in some places, like if we have to travel, we may have to ask for stage hands. And so that would be something that you'd ask for is to have load in, load out help, you know, if you're at a place where you can't bring your own local crew. Yeah. So that'll be another thing. Again, the covered stage is the one that's come up and bit me the most times. You know, I don't, oh, I haven't covered thought Covered stage. Oh, covered stage. Because yeah. we've been asked to play outdoor gigs and they, you know, they might put a stage or have us somewhere. But, you know, those mid-afternoon gigs when you're under the sun, we just did one at a country club. Oh, it's, and, that um, sucks. It does. And it was, you know, high sun. Uh, they were there, the, they didn't even have the the way that it worked is they had kind of fixed umbrellas. And so they provided two that one year. It was a hot day. So, that, you know, where the band was like, we're not doing that again, unless they can guarantee everyone in the band could be covered. And so we asked and we explained why. And usually actually when you point that out, you know, people are pretty cool about it. Nobody yeah. wants anyone to be miserable. So, yeah. you know, that wasn't a hard get. Yep. So yeah, covered stage, whatever that might mean, whether it's a canopy or a tent or, or, or high tent or high uh, tents, um, uh, or high umbrellas, excuse me. Um, that's another thing that we that we typically ask for. Um, waters uh, are important. Waters. Yep. Yep. In some places, it might be beer and it might be some snacks, depending upon the time that we're playing. Um, a green room, like a place to change. That's often something that, you know, it's good for you to ask for. Not every place can provide it. But, you know, if you're going to be there for a while, you need a place to hang out. When the when the gig is happening, um, I, I would say especially if you're doing like country club gigs, weddings, whatever you know, corporate events, that kind of thing, you are going to need to get there. You know, let's say the 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 party starts like for a wedding, man. Y- you know, if, if the reception dinner starts at seven o'clock, uh, y- you know that means dancing doesn't necessarily start till like eight thirty. There might be cocktail hour at six o'clock. You might have to provide music for that or or maybe even an iPod, depending on what they want. That means, you know, if the guests are getting there at six, you're there by three, maybe four o'clock starting to set up. And then you have nothing to do for many and nowhere many, to go <laughs> and nowhere to go. Yeah. For many hours. So asking for that, that green room, it, it may seem on the surface like, oh, well, we're living large here. Honest, to be perfectly honest time I, I try to limit the amount of time that I spend in the green room at, at weddings. You really can't avoid it, but it's boring. I mean, it, it, it can, it you boring. can make the most of it cause you're just hanging out with your band, but like literally that's what you're doing is just hanging out with the band. That's so let, let, let me kind of interject there. I would, I would actually say it is boring, but in the, some of the gigs where we've had ridiculously long waits in between, 
and the the band brings like cards against humanity or oh, we yeah. play cards or we play it is actually a great bonding opportunity it's a, for it the is band. great bonding because it is, is sublimely true. boring it is ridiculous <laughs> that you sublimely. <laughs> right yeah yeah yo that's that's it cards against humanity is like a really good idea i like that idea <laughs> yeah that's that's a good i haven't brought that yet usually the conversations that we have with uptown uh delve deep into the same sort of realm that that cards against humanity would bring us so i feel like i feel like for that band in particular that might be a good thing i will say with fling and i i will not but well, maybe i'll share a story um it, so we're sitting in the green room at at this club here uh it, it's called wentworth by the sea really old like really old new england money um and classic like you cannot be seen what you when you're loading in, it's fine. But once the guests start to arrive and they have, they'll have multiple things going on. It's a pretty big place. So they could have a, you know, a few events happening simultaneously. Once the guests start to arrive, you are the help and you shall not be seen in public. Right. right? So they right. have like tunnels and paths that like bring you through the kitchen and things like that to move from room to room where you can, you know, move invisibly. So under that vibe of things, you know, we were in, they gave, we were playing a, a corporate party. This is years and years ago and we're sitting and they feed us and you know, it's just the five of us. Right. And, and they bring five because this is just how this place is. They bring five, you know, plates out with five servers and they put them down mm -hmm. in front of us. It's just one table in the middle of this empty room with the five mm -hmm. of us sitting at it. And they, they pull the top off and there's a, it's a nice meal. There's, it looks like, you know, chicken and, and mashed potatoes and like some asparagus and stuff. And it was very tasty. And the chicken was like really, really good. It was succulent and delicious. And we're like, hey, maybe this isn't chicken. What could this be? So we're, we're going around and around. Trying to decide, like, what could this what what, what could this be? And we're like, well, is it pheasant? Is it quail? And and we just like intentionally are starting to get ridiculous about this because, like you said, it's it's phenomenally sublimely boring, sublimely boring, sublimely yes. boring. There it is. And uh, and we're just passing these ideas around. And it's like, well, what would be like super decadent? Like, you know, 100 years ago when this place was, you know, all I mean, it's still in its prime, but, you know, in its heyday, like what would what would have been served here to like the Uber elite, you know, in a, in a way that felt like decadent and exclusive and all of that stuff. And so we're coming up with ideas and I look at Aaron, our keyboard player, and this guy has the best, he is one of the most creative people I know. You, if you met him, you would think he was just like straight Mr. Corporate and he certainly can play that role. And, uh, but his mind works in, in very interesting ways. And he has this twinkle in his eye. And I know that the conversation is about to end because I know he's about to say something that no one will even want to top, let alone be able to. And uh, and he looks at us and he's like, oh, it's eagle. <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah, it's perfect. Bald eagle, yeah. yeah, right. Like who would Love eat it. bald eagle? But that's exactly what, you know, what the like the vibe of this place. The was Gatsby. Like. The Gatsby. Gatsby. Yeah, exactly. So it was like, so we ate eagle. And then, of course, when we were playing Eagles tunes, you know, later that night <laughs> on stage, we're looking at each other and just cracking up on stage. But that's yeah, great. yeah, yeah, exactly. So anyway, All right, two more things. My yeah. last two things for my writer request. One is specifics about parking and along with that is like access to stage like you know my horn guys can park and walk in but my keyboard player and my drummer have to park get close to the stage and it has to be clear how they can get access to the stage yeah, you know, find had, out about how many floors you know ceiling uh, not ceilings but how many like stairs is there an elevator is are you sharing that entrance and exit path with other contractors and what time are they arriving because that can be a huge thing if you're getting there at the same time as catering and they need to use the same entrance as you you may wind up you may wind yeah. up sitting there yeah for 20 minutes while they're doing their thing coordinating that whole arrival and the path in and out that's really important a good party planner or wedding planner should I'll do that automatically, but it never hurts to ask. They'll appreciate it right. if you ask. Yeah. Yeah. Last thing is bar privileges. So, you know, especially in events where there's an open bar, you know, I'd say it's 50, 50, where if there's an open bar, you know, the hosts are usually, yeah, you're welcome, you know, join in. But there's some places that, again, the band should not, shall not be seen except for performing. Don't mingle with the guests. I mean, that, that can be a thing. Yep. But what is the, what is the, you know, one drink ticket, you know, whatever it may be. That's the other uh, thing that I would put on a rider. So that's yeah. kind of a rough list of my, of my wish list of things that I put on. And again, I would, 
emphasize it's good to ask for it all. Yes. It's not going to, once you've agreed on a price, these are details of the, uh, after the fact of the contract, right? This is not, you know, it's true. I, I, and, and you can decide what you can and can't put up with, yep. but a writer is, is part of the, is part of the transaction to make sure that they get the best performance and they get that the band is in the best position playing. Yeah. As long as you're not, as long as you have like a, I, I call it a straight face reason. Like you can look somebody in the eye and say, Oh no, this is why we need a green room. And you explain to them, don't tell them the Eagle story necessarily folks. You know, uh-huh. that's, that's between us here. But, um, but you know, explain to them, like, we're going to, but where are we going to go? Oh, right. Didn't think about that. Let's find you a spot. Like as long as you can have a straight face conversation about all the things you're going to put in your rider, put it in the rider. Because like Paul said, the worst that happens is they call you and say, dude, we can't do this. And uh, I'll never forget when I was in college, we played in a band and uh, and there was a uh, an event happening on campus with a, a band that was fairly big at the time called Luna. Right. And uh, they were signed act, they were touring act and they were coming around and we were opening for them probably because our singer was on the committee that organized the event. But, you know, whatever we were, fa- we were. To many people on campus, we were more well-known than they were. So it actually made sense. In, in, in a lot of senses, it felt like a double bill for the night, which was very cool. But because Jeff was on the committee, he had to deal with Luna and their management and their rider and all of that. And he got their rider and he's looking at it and he's freaking out because he's like, I, I, we can't do like th- we don't have the budget to do all this stuff that they're asked. So he calls up their management, you know, tail between his legs. Like, we really want to have you like this is we're really looking forward to this gig. But, you know, there's a few things in the rider we can't do. And management were like, oh, yeah, nobody ever even nobody ever does that yeah. thing. Yeah, exactly. It's like, it like, oh, you can do these other two things. Dude, that would be fantastic. Bonus, yeah. Right. Yeah. This was all bonus. So, yeah, don't be afraid. You, you know, most people are a little more seasoned than Jeff was when he was whatever, you know, 18 or something. Like most of the people you're dealing with have been through this a few times. They know to call you and tell you, hey, look, you know, here's the thing. You're not asking for anything unreasonable. If they think it's unreasonable, it's either because they're inexperienced or they just don't understand why you're asking and and be ready to have that conversation in a very non-adversarial way. It, it, it'll work out. I would add one thing to this, Paul. Um, I would add lights because it, mm. depending on the 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 you know the the scenario, you know, you may not have bought enough Chauvet DJ lights, right? To to cover whatever the scenario is. We've certainly had that where it's like, oh, okay, this is a big outdoor gig. You know, in in Fling, we don't have even even in Uptown, we've got lights to cover like the stage. But if you need lights on the crowd or sometimes if for a big venue, if you need stage wash, right, to to actually, you know, light up the performers uh, because the stage is bigger or whatever it is, that that may not be something you have in your arsenal. Don't be afraid to ask for that, you know, and like the first Uptown gig that I did was at the Boston Public Library. I've mentioned it a few times on here, I think, in, in various different stories, the load in and load out there was horrendous. Not only was there literally no place to park, but there was, you know, maybe a small elevator and then stairs. And it was a disaster. Uh, we decided we walked out of that gig and said, we will never play here again. And then we then we revised it. We said, no, 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 wait a minute. I would happily come and play here again. I will never be loading gear in and out of here again. So think about that and don't be afraid. You know, this was a very high dollar gig. Any gig where someone's renting out the Boston Public Library, it's going to be a high dollar gig like that happens before they even see our fee, let alone agree to it. Don't be afraid to ask for a backline. Say, look, it's it's the middle of Boston. Uh, you know, there, there are people that understand how to load things in and out. They can do it they, like that's their business. That is not our business. You know, mm-hmm. we, we are there to go and play and entertain. So here's what we need for a backline. And again, you know, just give them that stuff. And we've done that at, at a few gigs since then we haven't played there, but, but you know, that was a learning experience for us. Like, Oh, if the load in looks like a disaster, just, just offload it to somebody else. You know, SIR is a great company for that. I'll, I'll put a link in the show notes we've used them paul for our yep. um for our cirque de mac gigs and they were fantastic and i'll tell you there's nothing better than walking finishing the last song putting my sticks in my stick bag zipping it up and walking away from the stage now you know for the cirque de mac parties i then had to write a check later for the people that came and picked up all the drums and gear but you know it was a really nice thing thankfully we had sponsor dollars to cover that check so it really didn't you know wasn't, <laughs> didn't hurt 
But yeah, it makes a big difference when you, you know, you don't have to deal with stairs and city loading and all like that can be that can really change a, the nature of a gig when you've got when, you know, you're in the middle of a city and trying to deal with that sort of thing. Really enter that realm cautiously. Um, that's, you know, there you go. So, Agreed. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Hey, I have one more thing I want to talk to you about today. And yeah, I finally got around to seeing Bohemian Rhapsody. Have you seen it? Uh, yeah, I saw it in the theater. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was great. And um, I, I was like, I, I, I'm a Queen fan. I mean, there's plenty of their songs are like. I'm not a crazy fan and I don't sure. know a lot about the history of the band. So that was kind of fun. And so like any inquisitive person, I, I went to IMDb to kind of see what the background on some of the stories are. And the most interesting thing was, I did not know this, but that opening scene um, about when the, when the first band, Smile, that uh, you know, the lead singer quits in the movie and Freddie replaces him. Yep. Did you know that in real life, there was actually a moment where Roger Taylor was asked to audition for Genesis and oh, he did that, not. And Collins got that gig. That makes perfect sense. Actually, I did not know that, but I did know from the Genesis movie, which is called oh, some of all parts or something really great movie to see, because not only do they have footage from back then, but they have like footage from today with all of them, including Gabriel and all that stuff talking about it. But specifically when Gabriel left, they said that they would bring in uh, um, drummers, but they would also bring in singers. The reason Phil got the gig was they would bring in singers and um, Phil would sing them the parts so that they could then, you know, learn how the melodies went and, and sing them. And no one like they would finish the auditions and be like, yeah, still, we don't have anybody good enough. We don't like Phil, you know, Phil even sounds better than these people. And I was like, hey, wait a minute. you know, so <laughs> hey, if wait I, hey, wait a minute. But Phil says even to this day, he is still like the new guy in that band. He, despite having all of his own solo commercial success, when he shows up to a Genesis scenario, it's like he's a hired gun. Yes, sir. No, Wasn't sir. there going to be a Genesis reunion tour last year? Wasn't this something supposed to happen? Yeah, there's always talk. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. But anyway, sorry. So I didn't mean to derail you, but I had no idea that Roger Taylor was one of those drummers that, that auditioned for Gen or, or was, uh, you know, tapped to audition for Genesis. Yeah. That the timeline sense. certainly match up. Yeah. So for sure. Yeah. Huh. But it, it was a great movie. And they, I, I'm reminded that not only did they write some really, really cool tunes, what a distinctive sound that that band had, not only just the, you know, remarkable vocals and the you know, innovative approach to vocals, but man, Brian May is just, Oh. fantastic right i mean the, you hear one note and you know it's brian may that's that's rock and roll hall of fame stuff well in the songwriting you know i i never really dove into learning queen songs until we did that madhouse last year or earlier yeah. this year it wasn't even last year but you know uh whatever it was in march or april and you know we learned whatever 11 queen songs but that meant learning like 35 songs because every song had six different parts to it that were remarkably different from the others and you got to get the transitions right and all that 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 music is you're right it's it's it it's it's unique it's not and also like beatles like you know the beatles obviously met when they were much younger but yeah if you want we were talking about how how live music is a performing and visual art the other thing that it is is a remarkable exercise in serendipity. I mean, the Beatles are the most obvious. They met when they were so young. Right. How did those four guys, and they were, you know, they were four guys who decided to be in a band together. You know, like, it wasn't like they went through hundreds of the top guys in Liverpool before they chose the four that were going to be the Beatles, right? You know, as we know, <laughs> yeah. Ringo is really the only major replacement. How did that remarkable level of talent get extracted from those four guys? I mean, the only answer is that that's the magic of, you know, those four talents, when blended, brought out something deeper within each of them. And I think Queen is kind of similar as well. I mean, that sound of Queen and those kind of really interesting pop hooks in Queen is a result of, you know, four creative people all kind of lending their their, yeah. their soul to it. And you get something much bigger than the sum of the parts. Yes, that's right. That's it is. It, Queen definitely fits that same kind of description like the the fact that these four people came together and to create this magic is a really wonderful thing because individually none of them would have done as well right. uh yeah it wasn't like driven by one chief songwriter and nobody else had a part in it like this was four distinct personalities and here you go this is the product yeah 
Yeah, it's pretty good. It's, it's one of the other magical things about being in a band and and is is you are part of the total essence that is creating something remarkable. Not only, again, we just say the most obvious thing is, is the visual performance stuff. Like people are looking at you, be interesting to look at, mm. but, but be interesting to set to, you know, to find a sound. Find, what is your band sound? It's a result of, you know, I love that everybody wanted to sound like Stevie Ray Vaughan at one time. And there's an interview where Stevie Ray says, listen, it's all in your fingers, man. It's, you know, you, you will sound like you, you could pick up my gear, exactly my gear. You will still sound like you. Yeah. The, atta- the attack you put, the vibrato you put on the strings, your bends, everything that goes into you, it makes you, you now add that with the four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, my band, 10 other instruments. Yeah. And it sounds like you. And there's something holistically beautiful about that. That is, you know, it's just that how is it the is. thing that should be embraced. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. There was an interview in modern drummer when I was a kid with Bill Bruford and somebody was asking him, you know, what symbols did you use on this particular yes recording or whatever? I really want to get that sound. And Bruford, you know, it was a written response. It was in modern drummer, which came out once or I guess still does come out once a month. And, uh, his response was really nice. He's like, Oh, you know, I, I don't remember specifically. That was a long time ago, but I think it was, you know, these particular symbols, et cetera, et cetera. And he said, but I don't mean to be cheeky about this, but you know, the person, the hand holding the stick that <laughs> hits the symbol has more to do with the way this, the way it sounds than the symbol that's being hit, you know? And he's totally right. Like Bill would sound like Bill on my drums and Stevie would sound like Stevie on your guitar. Like, like it's, it's just, true. it's just how it goes. And that like, that's actually a good thing. No, there's nothing wrong with finding someone whose style and sound and, and method of playing and vibe that you like and, emulating them to the point of learning more things about your instrument. Right. And all of that stuff sort of bakes into what becomes your own style. But even if you only ever studied one person, the chances of you sounding just like them, even in that scenario are slim. Uh, The the legendary bands that most of us, you know, point to as being foundational. Most of them have that story. They started out fairly young together. Yeah. They learned together. They blended together. They they grew together. I guess Zeppelin would be a, a little bit different, right? Because uh, half yeah. of Zeppelin were studio musicians. They were fairly they were fairly experienced by the time Zeppelin came along. But I mean, if you think about the Stones, you think about the Beatles. You know, think about most of the bands that are the foundational sounds of rock and roll. They're not create that unique sound is the result of. I don't know, kids growing up together, musicians coming of age together. It is a, a natural and holistic thing that cannot be reproduced artificially. Yes, that's right. Yeah. No, it's it's it right. You can't. It's just you just gotta play. That's it. Yeah. Just play. It's and true. listen and listen to each other. Like that's the key, I think. And to make a band work, you know, we're talking about the Beatles and Queen. If those guys were two head they were all headstrong individuals, don't get me wrong. But if they weren't so headstrong that they didn't listen to each other. And that, I think, is the key. So, yeah. Fun stuff. I also recommend seeing Rocket Man. Um, Loved it. Yeah. That is far more of a musical than the the other ones. I would call those, you know, biopics or whatever. And certainly Rocket Man is a biopic. But, you know, they break into song for no apparent reason in it, which is my definition of a musical. That Rocket Man seems to me like it was written to be turned into a Broadway show. I mean, totally. they, they, they pick a song, not chronologically in order of what's going on, but if it fits the story of what's, of what is happening That's the right. of the time. Yep. So they kind of borrow, you know, later songs for earlier moments. If the theme of the song is, if it is fits. appropriate. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. No. And, uh, and our friend Giles has a nice little cameo in, in the first studio scene in that movie, which is also Very nice cool. to see. Yeah, yeah. 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 Movie star too. Grammy winner, freaking guy. Anyway, uh, <laughs> Uh, I don't know. What else do we have? I think that's it, right? That's it. All right. Well, feedback at giggabpodcast.com. We would love to hear from you. Uh, let us know what you put in your rider. Let us know what you think about, you know, stage layouts and making sure you get, you know, visual contact with your band members when you need it. Let us know what you think about all these rock movies. Let us know whatever you think. It's all good. Check out Chauve DJ at C H A U V E T D J dot com too and get some stuff from him, but tell him thank you because that's cool. What else you got, man? Anything else? 
What's that thing we always say? What is that thing we always say? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Always be performing. 